Have you been waiting for FAA news on the upcoming Starship flight? I know I have, and there is a lot to dive into with that alone. Along with that though, so many amazing topics that I'm sure that you are going to find very intriguing. It is an absolute adventure every week, and this one is dense, my friends, so let's rip right into it. This video is sponsored by Novium, creating innovative hover pens inspired by space to stimulate curiosity and creativity. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. If you've been watching along every week, and a huge thank you to everybody that does by the way, you might have noticed that some tasks keep being repeated down at the Starbase launch site. This week has certainly been no exception. Jumping into action was Booster 9's hot staging ring yet again being lifted back up by the launch site crane and integrated on top of the booster. This looked to have been removed for a similar reason as last time, to get another good look at the avionics and other components around that forward dome. Hopefully you recall last week that a possible grid fin motor had been lifted off. That we don't believe has been reinstalled just yet, so I suspect SpaceX were wanting to prioritise a wet dress launch rehearsal first. It didn't quite go to plan though. In what seems like a recurring pattern, only a day after the hot staging ring had been installed, Ship 25 was preparing for another lift to complete the full stack again with Booster 9. The ship quick disconnect arm swung away here in the early morning, and after a few hours, the highway closed and the pad clear alarm began sounding at the launch complex. There was more to this than just the stacking operation though. Announcements made on the PA system told us that Ship 26 was also included in the upcoming action with another test planned. Now, as time ticked closer to midday, the pad team had cleared out and it was go time. Ship 25 was airborne once again and its third ever full stacking operation was underway. Now, if we compare this to the previous stacking, I've got to say that the process looked a lot smoother to me with fewer pauses or horizontal movements while it was raised up. The ship was soon at the top, swung over the booster, and then carefully and slowly lowered down. With the ship now fully stacked, it was time to hook up the quick disconnect. Interestingly, a few people had returned at this point to help with that alignment, but it seemed like there were a few hiccups going on. A few hours later, the road closure was removed, so no testing was going to take place that day after all. The next morning, SpaceX was still hard at work trying to fix whatever that issue with the quick disconnect was, but it didn't look like they were having any luck at all. In fact, they were preparing to destack it again instead. Ship 25's transport stand was moved back into the lifting position at the launch tower, and I'll just pause here and mention that we've seen these new alignment brackets appear on the stand. Now, that I'm guessing is going to help to more easily guide a lowering vehicle back to it without needing to fine tune its position quite so much. So here we were just over 24 hours after the full stack the day before, and Ship 25 was already heading back to ground level. Just as a quick reminder, the ship has been stacked twice before, and until now, we haven't seen any issues with its quick disconnect. They took some extra time for a deep investigation with machinery such as this S1 Titan scanner to check for issues with the welding, I imagine, or some shots there by Starship Gazer. On Friday, everything looked great again with the ship heading back up. This time, the quick disconnect worked perfectly fine, so bring on that wet dress rehearsal. While on the topic of the orbital launch systems, it is quite incredible to me to see just how accurate Ryan Hansen's recent render of the full stack is to the real photograph posted not so long ago by Elon. That is just amazing, and it's always a treat to see what the community is up to. He's also done loads of updates to match all of the recent orbital launch mount upgrades as shown in this smashing 360 degree animation. Now midweek we did see a short change of focus back to Ship 26. For the first time since November of 2021 I believe, we had what appeared to be a pre-burner test only here. These days we tend to see spin prime tests instead which don't include any fiery excitement, but for some reason they wanted to run this test instead of perhaps a full static fire. Two days later on Friday though, yes, this was indeed a static fire and it looked like the exact same engine to me. This has raised some curious questions. Why was a pre-burner test being introduced into this ship's testing campaign? And why was there no water suppression running? 
over at the build site this week, we've got a lot to catch you up on. Take the new Star Factory for example. Of course there is the first phase of it which has been hard at work making a lot of the ring sections for both the booster and Starship vehicles. The next more recent phase though is rapidly coming along. There's the section right next to the first phase which at the start of construction was set up as a separate building. Now it has been extended to become fully integrated. Once they take out the internal walls for that building it'll form one big unit. Continuing towards the road we can see that the construction is simply screaming along now with a bunch of the roof work already making big progress ending with what I can only describe as the third visible section which ends right at Highway 4. Now what you might notice is the same two step height increase just like we've seen at their Roberts Road facility across the country in Florida. If you take a look here SpaceX still doesn't own this little piece of grass covered land. As a result they have simply offset this third section towards the ring yard and the stacking bays. What you may find odd is that the old production tent is still visible too gradually being circled by the far more permanent Star Factory. It kind of looks weird sitting right there by itself doesn't it? Now these two higher sections of the building will be the location where they construct the taller parts of the ship, the nose cone and the payload bay barrel. That especially needs quite a bit of overhead room as the Starlink Pez dispenser is lowered in from the top, something that's historically always been done outside. Now the construction of the second mega bay has come a long way since I last updated you on it. We are now far enough along for the bridge cranes to be lifted up. First both of the girders and then the trolley with a hook already installed was placed on top of the rails inside the building. Now that was quickly repeated the next day for the second bridge crane. With those last major pieces added next up were the roof beams to go into place. Now the exact purpose this mega bay will be used for is still a bit of a mystery but it is probably safe to assume that they will store and construct boosters and starships in here just like the first. Over in the high bay ship 32 work is pushing further along with its forward dome section making an appearance. After a brief moment when it popped back out for some unknown reason it went back in this time with the nose cone coming to pick it up. Those were stacked together soon after so great progress on this ship already. Back to the old ship 22 nose cone made to look like some kind of human landing system mock up. It looks like they want to make it look even more like the imagined moon lander design because the heat shield tiles were being stripped off around the forward aero covers followed by the full removal of those too. It won't surprise me if this ends up with a completely white painted exterior. Way over at the Massey's test facility Booster 11 kicked off a cryogenic test of the methane tank with only a small amount in the oxygen tank. Then a second test did the complete opposite, fully loading up the oxygen tank with a little appearing in the methane tank afterward. Along with that the new E-Dome test tank that arrived a few weeks back finally joined in on the action with a cryogenic test of its own. Now that we are coming to the end of October we shouldn't be far away from some hopefully positive FAA news regarding the next full stack test flight. So make sure that you are here subscribed and following along. The anticipation is once again building my friends and a huge thanks of course for you passing that enthusiasm to those around you who may not know what is going on here. It is super exciting and almost half a million of you can't be wrong right? We are so close now. Thanks for helping us get there. Now I think it is a very positive sign that we are seeing closures like this pop up just yesterday. This as you can see is announcing an urgent road closure on Sunday tomorrow. Even more interesting it's involving the testing of two separate starships in preparation for the upcoming launch approvals. In fact there is a lot of very exciting FAA stuff going on which I'll dive into in a moment and the Fish and Wildlife Service were spotted around Starbase late this week. Things are looking amazing. Speaking of amazing things check out this hover pen inspired by Space by Novium the sponsor of today's video. This here my friends is the hover pen interstellar edition a beautiful tribute to space gravity and magnetism floating in its special dock at a 23.5 degree angle. The same as Earth's axial tilt giving us the glorious seasons of the year. It's crafted from aircraft grade aluminum and it is a really sturdy metal design weighted really nicely. I've been using it for a few months and I just love it. 
In fact, it's the only pen on my desk now which adds that nice little touch to the workspace as it stands there defying gravity. And it's a real conversation starter. It comes in a bunch of colours too. Check this out, you've got the space black one like the one I've got here. Then there is the Mars Magma, the Starlight Silver and Neptune Blue giving you plenty of cosmic options. A really neat option though if you are a huge nerd like me is that you can pick it up with a real meteorite shard embedded into the end. It's an extra sweet piece of the cosmos to have right there in your hand. They also have the Hover Pen Future Edition which is a two-in-one rollerball and fountain pen. You just switch out the tips as you want. A great option if you love that elegant fountain pen writing experience. It's that time of year again my friends so if you are looking for the ultimate unique gift well you have just found it. Use code MarcusHouse for free worldwide shipping and a 10% off discount. Link in the description below. Thank you Novium. Now sadly there is no direct news yet from the FAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service but this week quite an interesting news article dropped from Eric Berger at Ars Technica. In this it was shared that senior management at SpaceX is strongly urging the US government to provide more funding to the FAA. Funding to aid in not just the certification of the Starship program but actually the entire space sector. Another great example in this article were the much more commonplace Falcon 9 launches taking place from Vandenberg in California. In this case SpaceX has deliberately chosen to only really do night launches from there as the launch trajectory comes quite close to Hamala Beach. To do day launches they would actually need to determine with the FAA if the beach needs to be closed. Now the problem is if they were to request this it would directly take away resources from the Starship analysis. Even worse is that this problem extends even further to other agencies requesting FAA approvals. On Wednesday in fact the US Senate discussed these same issues with key representation from SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic and others as well. This is a critically important hearing. We are at an inflection point with incredible innovation in commercial space launch. The criticality is especially true in the face of strategic competition from state actors like China. Starship has been ready for its next flight test for more than a month but we are waiting for an FAA license and accompanying interagency review. The positive thing is that there was wide agreement that regulatory reform was needed. More staff to support the sector obviously but a lot of talk about a goal to provide more of a one-stop shop for approvals instead of needing to deal with so many different government agencies. We need to cut red tape around all the various types of permitting that permeate commercial space. Too many agencies are involved. It slows technological and scientific advancements and it puts us at, at a disadvantage compared to our international competitors and rivals. It is long past time that we create a true one-stop shop for the regulation and licensing of commercial space activity. Yeah, that's pretty good right? Make no mistake, to continue to stay ahead of China in this new space race, the big players in the commercial industry simply can't remain stuck on the pad. As said, inefficient regulation is decreasing American competitiveness at the same time as space programs elsewhere around the world rise up. I think what is wonderful is that there is a really strong push to resolve this problem now. The burden should be put on us as a private company, put on SpaceX and let us develop at the fastest pace. We should be the ones that are driving the development, not being driven by regulatory oversight. Well, and having seen firsthand what you're doing in South Texas, it is extraordinary and very, very impressive. My final question, if you were still at NASA, would this delay be acceptable? Would schedule delays like this be something that makes a NASA program successful? Simply would not be acceptable. Thank you. So I've got a link to the full video and the Ars Technica article in the description if you want to comb over all of that. After my last video went live, SpaceX finally released a much better quality beautiful shot of the double booster landing from the Falcon Heavy. This delay between both of the booster landings was intentional by the way. Although the first few Falcon Heavy flights had them landing quite close together, they've spaced them out over time. It's a little safe that way so they don't interfere with each other and yes, this is just amazing isn't it? I've had a number of people ask how you can keep up to date with the progress. Now obviously a primary way is to follow NASA's news updates directly but if you haven't tinkered with the eyes on the solar system website before you've got to check this out. Here we can see 16 Psyche, the asteroid or what
what we currently believe it looks like. Zooming right out, we can speed up time and see how it orbits the Sun in between Mars and Jupiter. Now, over here is the Psyche spacecraft right now. Well, as of capturing this on screen at least, it has been ejected out of the Earth's sphere of influence, moving faster in the orbit to climb up towards Mars. Speed up the time, and you can see it intercept the red planet, perform a gravity assist, and then head out to catch 16 Psyche. It's an absolutely fascinating tool to play around with, and you can even see things like the size of the spacecraft compared to all sorts of other stuff, such as the Hubble Space Telescope. You can even see the size of 16 Psyche compared to something like Comet Halley. Just to put into perspective how big this is, this here is asteroid Bennu from the OSIRIS-REx mission. It is almost too small to even see comparatively. I've got links to this awesome tool in the description below. Now the great news is that so far everything has gone completely to plan with this mission. About an hour after launch, the spacecraft had separated and commanded itself to be placed into a planned safe mode while it awaited commands from mission control. After two-way communication was established with NASA's Deep Space Network here in Canberra, Australia, all the reports were that it was in good health. Just as a cool side note, this recent tour by EEV blog of the complex is a fascinating watch alone actually, so I'll pop a link to that below as well. So NASA should be powering on the optical communication technology demonstration in about two weeks when Psyche is about 7.5 million kilometers away from the Earth. I'm looking forward to this event in particular because it's going to be the first test beyond the moon of the new laser communication technology. At six weeks after launch, which will be around the end of November, there will be active checks on the science instruments. That will include the magnetometer, the gamma ray and the neutron spectrometer and the multispectral imager. We should then receive its first images used for calibration purposes. They're going to target stars and star clusters with different exposures and several filters. Apparently the Psyche team will then be activating some sort of automatic feed for the public so that we can watch along and see the raw images coming in for the duration of the entire mission. That is cool, and yes, the first 100 days of the mission is all about commissioning and the gradual checkouts. A key part of that is to ensure that the electric thrusters are ready to begin continuously firing over long stretches of the trajectory. There is a lot of fun new technology on board. Now, as is routine these days, Starlink action tends to run pretty consistently each week. I'm sure that you are probably like me and that you don't need to know the detail and the statistics on all of these missions, but I imagine that you do still like to know if there's anything interesting about any particular flight. That is why this great video is playing right now, which was released by SpaceX almost a week ago. This was actually from the Group 622 Starlink mission, but these highlights were shared as they announced that they had delivered more than 900 100 metric tons to orbit so far this year. That is just incredible considering that we are only in October. This one was a particularly beautiful flight with the sun illuminating the rocket components as it proceeded through the various stages of the mission. My favorite piece though is this, the release of the Starlink version 2 mini satellites. Only the third time that we've ever seen deployment shots from those V2 minis. It's incredible to me just how much detail that you can see simply from the reflective surface as they drift away there. Since then, of course, we've had another Starlink mission on Tuesday from Slick 40 in Florida, and you should notice the new crew tower being built has grown since the last flight. See this? Yeah, that was moved over just prior, and it was already stacked here for this launch. There is no messing around at SpaceX. This Falcon 9 was on its 16th flight, so not quite the record breaker, but close as it landed there on the drone ship just to read the instructions. The next Starlink launch was actually supposed to be just as I was about to render out this very video, so that has probably now flown from Vandenberg already. So I don't think that I can really avoid the topic of this incredible eclipse action almost a week ago. On Saturday, the 14th of October, this ring of fire passed over parts of North and South America. Let's just go back to the eyes on the solar system website. You can see exactly where the eclipse was most visible. We missed out here in Australia, of course, we were sleeping through it, but for those of you in the right place at the right time, the views were just absolutely stunning. This was an annular solar eclipse, not an annual one, which would imply that it happens every year, but annular. Now what makes this event different from a total solar eclipse is that this happens when the moon passes between the sun and earth at about its farthest point in its orbit. 
orbit. This is an important point because the Moon's orbit around the Earth isn't quite circular. It is just slightly elliptical. At closest approach, it's around 357,000 kilometers, and at its farthest, about 407,000 kilometers, depending on the time of year. So yeah, it might not seem like much, but that difference of 13% or so means that in this case, it couldn't completely cover the Sun's disk. That is the important point, because it made the conditions perfect for this incredible ring of fire in the sky, and wow, was this amazing to see. From this vantage point, the Sun was shining past at only 10% of its true brightness. Now, this type of eclipse isn't going to happen again in America until June of 2039, so it is rare enough to make a special trip to these events if you are close by. You know what I think is even more amazing, though? Just take a look at these real photos from the Deep Space Climate Observatory spacecraft taken several hours apart. Isn't that just breathtaking? ISRO has been busy once again taking massive steps towards a goal that they've been excited about for literally over a decade now. No, not Chandrayaan-3, the astounding lunar South Pole lander or the ongoing Aditya L1 solar observatory, but instead their human spaceflight program. Let's just take a trip all the way back to 2007 when the very first iPhone was released. Yeah. It has been a while. That same year, ISRO performed the Space Capsule Recovery Experiment. This demonstrated they were capable of safely managing and returning an analog crew mission, and it was the first sign that they were serious about pursuing crewed flight. Two years later, the Indian government authorized the Human Spaceflight Program. However, only initial funding for this was secured at the time. With lots of minor successes since, including their verified advanced crew escape suit and multiple boilerplate tests of landing and abort scenarios, slowly but surely, ISRO has been creeping towards this massive milestone. Now, here we are with a full-scale mock-up of the Gaganian spacecraft's crew module. That's right, ISRO aimed to gain even more ground with this very bizarre looking test vehicle abort mission one. It is a super strange looking rocket, isn't it? That's because it only needed enough thrust to complete an abort test, not unlike the Crew Dragon launch escape demonstration by SpaceX back in 2020. On top, a full scale crew module. Propelling it into the sky, a single liquid rocket stage equipped with a modified human-rated version of the engines, the same Vickers engine used in the LVM-3. The plan here was to shoot that crew module to an altitude of about 17 kilometers, fire up that abort motor, and release it. Afterward, of course, deploying its parachutes to make a safe landing back around 10 kilometers downrange from the landing site. To me, it all looked like a perfect test, and with this now out of the way, ISRO has another few tests lined up. Two uncrewed orbital test flights of the Gaganian capsule on LVM-3 rockets. Instead of normal crew, they will have Vimitra on board their spacefaring humanoid robot, possibly one of the creepier robots that I've seen lately. In the end, they hope to have the first humans on board actually flying to orbit by about 2025. ISRO has a lot of future plans because they're going to move on to develop their own dedicated space station. In fact, they sent out a press release a few days ago announcing their plans to build it by 2035 and to get humans to the moon by 2040. What do you think? Do you think this all sounds feasible? Let me know in the comments below. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe so we get to keep making them. If you would like to help more directly like these many, many wonderful people, all this support makes a colossal difference to us. It really does. If you want to continue with more space goodness, the algorithm thinks that you will enjoy this video here next, or maybe these videos. Thanks for watching all this way through, and I'll see you all in the next video.